the mighty and eternal Father, again we come to thy presence this day to worship you in spirit and truth. Thankful that you have given unto us the guide of thy spirit, to guide us into the knowledge of all truth for which we search. To opened up unto us by thy spoken word, and the revelation of thy written word, as you have moved upon holy men of thy calling, to record for us the scriptures, and you have inspired thy apostles to record in their records the pattern of events during thy ministry. And you have caused multitudes of others to record and to write. And you have moved with inspiration, and you have assured thy people that you have not withdrawn thy spirit. And you have declared that you do nothing except you unveil it to thy ministers and thy prophets. You have assured us of the eternal nature of thy kingdom, and of the spiritual center of thy kingdom, thy church. And you have promised to bring to our searching eyes all of the things that we would seek to know. So we thank thee for a continual compendium of facts, for an understanding of things that relate to our background and to the things that relate to our land. We pray that you shall grant unto us tonight understanding concerning thy hand upon us, upon the great heritage of this nation. We pray that you will help us to stir people who awaken out of their sleep, to throw off the yokes of attempted bondage and to drive the forces of evil from our land. Guide us, our Father, to move, to lift up thy standards before all nations. Grant unto us, our Father, leadership that shall be guided by thy spirit and not thy enemy. Grant unto us that a stand shall be so taken that the powers of darkness shall tremble before thee, knowing that we are thy children and that you have loved us. So as we commit ourselves to thy hand, we say thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then we ask it. Amen. Tonight, as we talk about the destiny of America, these United States, this great land, this prophetic part, there are a great number of clergy who do not even know that the United States has a part to play in human destiny, other than just the conditions which they see round about them and the realization that we are a great nation. They do not know that the Bible had anything to say about this great nation. They do not know from whence they've come or who they are. They do not know their racial and national identity as it relates to the program of the Scripture. So it's rather hard for anyone to talk about the prophecies of this nation that do not know who they are, where they came from, do not know how they are designated or what God has had to say about this matter. In fact, the amazing thing is so many know so little about the heritage of this continent and what existed upon it and what has gone before. For God has not only had his plans for you on this continent, but when the earth was rolled forth throughout uh, the forces of time, <clears throat> God Almighty was working a development for this place for his people to dwell in. He was preparing it for their occupation. He was developing this gorgeous wilderness, which was this new continent, for this purpose. When the forces of nature were creating their great upheavals, mountain ranges were rising and falling, when the sweeping passage of a comet's tail was to bathe the earth in the cold of outer space, as plunged back to the earth's surface came its frozen waters and its snows, and the ice ages were conditioning portions of the earth, little did men know that God was planting this great continent for you. When I say specifically that in God's plan this was one of the great final areas of leadership for the great nations of his kingdom, and a great nation that was destined to arise in this nation to carry the great outstretched wings of the eagle as its symbol, the symbol of the ancient house of Manasseh and under its measure and its color. This, my friends, was a part of divine destiny. We might point out to you that there are a lot of things that people do not realize concerning this great nation. For this great nation has certain qualifications that are only found in one other part of the earth. And this is rather significant. For God promised in the days when he spake to Israel and to his prophet Isaiah that he had a place he was going to plant as he had been preparing it in the ages and throughout time, a planting in the wilderness. And in this land of the wilderness, he said he was going to plant the fir tree, the box tree, and the myrtle tree, and the great cedars of Lebanon. Well, you say he was talking about Palestine. Well, unquestionably, he couldn't have been talking about uh, Palestine because Isaiah was in Palestine. 
And God had not only prepared also that the occupation of this great land was going to be occupied by the white race that had migrated down out of the upper Canaan basin uh, that had emerged in uh, the strong leadership of the days of Enoch down into Egypt and then back out of Egypt in part. The descending migrations of the house of Shem and even the house of Ham, which were both white men when they came down to the land of Ur the Chaldees, the calling of Abraham out of the land of Ur the Chaldees and calling that his race might be preserved and that no mongolization or integration take place. God called Abram to leave the land of Ur the Chaldees, let him be mongolized and not carry down his pure destiny and his spiritual capacity. And God made his covenants, which you find the unconditional covenants with Abraham, that I'll be a God unto thee, and I seed after thee in all their generations. And he made it with his son Isaac and with his son Jacob, and said, Out of Isaac shall the seed be called, and through Jacob shall I keep this covenant which I made with thy father Isaac and thy father Abraham. And out of Jacob's twelve sons came forth the great and mighty lines of the greatest nations the world has ever known, the nations of the white race. These are the white race nations. This is Adam man coming to his fulfillment. As we said to you this afternoon, the Adam man is the white man. And this is a special species from anybody else because the white race was the last race God placed upon the earth and they were his household. He begotten them. And as we told you when Ezekiel saw the throne of God rolled out of that great spacecraft in uh, the second chapter, first and second chapters of Ezekiel, he talks about these crafts. And when he talks about this, you will remember that he said that I beheld the throne, and he that came upon the throne for light and glory. So on this Friday, when he said he looked like Adam man. So therefore, this radiant God of light, the great white throne of the destiny of God's kingdom, uh, was a divine and purposeful planting. When he saw this great and majestic glory of a white God, he said he looked just like the Adam man, which is the white man. So you Adam children look like your father, and your father is identified with you. Some people don't like this, but then they wouldn't like anything that was true today uh, because it doesn't fall in with the propaganda that the world order is trying to sell you tonight. We point out to you, therefore, that it was out of this race and out of this household which God established that he brought forth Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his many sons. These twelve sons of Jacob all had a great prophetic destiny. Tonight we're not going to talk about them all. Now because I'm talking about the house of Joseph, the enemy has always tried to find some way to bring under attack anyone that tells the truth. He's got all kinds of names. He likes to say you're a cult, or he'd like to say you're British Israel, or you're something else. Well now, what about British Israel? Let's just meet this question tonight. The Anglo-Saxon peoples that are a part of what's called British Israel are Christians that believe that they are the house of Joseph. And they believe that this constitutes the strongest part of God's Israel in the world today. We embrace that this is true, but we go much farther than they do because we recognize that every white Christian nation in the world today is God's Israel. We recognize that Germany is the house of Judah, and we recognize that Ishakar is Finland. We recognize that among the Slavic peoples and the peoples of Romania and in the areas of Hungary, we know who they are. Uh, they are a part of Zebulon. We know today where every branch of the house of Israel is. We know their crests, their heraldry, their migrations, their history. Most of our critics don't so much as know the background of the history of Europe, let alone their own. So I point out to you tonight, we make no apologies for what we, what we know and what God unveils. We proclaim these facts because they are internally evident, and if the word of God is true and we believe it to be, now we have every evidence for it, then what God said he was going to do with these sons of Jacob and what nations he said he would make out of them, he must perform. And when he gave them symbols and signs and told them about where they would be in their power, then God to perform must do this, and God has performed this. And it would have been a strange thing that with all the prophecy of the ages and related to nations that a great nation like the United States could rise up, the most powerful force in the balance of right in the world today, and not be in the book. No, my friends, this is very much a part of this book and a part of God's pattern as it relates to it. And we discover that if you go back into the background of these peoples, that God Almighty unveiled in prophecy many things that would come to pass, and many of these things have now been fulfilled. When we talk about Israel, we watched it grow from its tribal status to a kingdom. We watched it advance from the days of Saul to David, and from David down to the time of Solomon. 
Then we watched its later history. We watched the divisions of ten tribes of Israel, which were to become a separate kingdom from Judah and Benjamin. Greatest and strongest among these tribes were the house of Joseph. The house of Joseph was made up of two tribes, the Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh was to be a great company or commonwealth of nations when he came to his fulfilled destiny. Manasseh was to be a great nation. The emblem of Joseph was to be like the unicorn, and this belongs to also the strength of the bullet and also the measure of the outstretched wings of the eagle. The house of Joseph has these three emblems. The lion, the unicorns on the British Empire, the house of Ephraim, which is a commonwealth of nations. The United States is a great nation and carries the destiny of the original Angles that helped to settle it, though to this nation was going to come some great new development that God had in mind. For under this great nation, when God developed, it was going to come a gathering of the people. Thus, out of all of the tribes of Israel, there was going to be gathered into one nation some of all of these people, that they might make one great mighty power, the symbol of God's kingdom. The only thing that could be synthesized, the only thing that could be amalgamated, the only thing that could be brought together with God's blessing were the various nations of the white race. You can't mix black and white without curses upon it. You can't mix Asiatic and white without degeneration. But you can fuse together or intermarry any one of the great nations of the white western world. And in this country you'll discover uh, that a strong part of your people with their Anglo-Saxon background and their Anglo destiny speaking the tongue of the Anglo-Saxons, but they have fused them themselves with the blood of Germany and they fused themselves with the blood of Scandinavia and we are today one great mighty white race. For here is the gathering the people's been. So let's take a look at the background of prophecy and destiny. For the destiny which God had bestowed upon his people concerned great driving forces that, that would move through their society and eventually direct them to this course. Long before we find the final settlements inside of Europe, which took place, as you remember, as the children of the northern ten tribes of Israel who had been captured by uh, the Assyrians in the days of Shalom and Israel, started their great migrations through the Caucasian Pass into Europe, moving their way to the Isles where they met some of their Celtic kinsmen uh, that had drifted down in the days when they were migrating from the Persian steppes and were to be found out of the Sephite forefathers already located in the Isles in various parts of Europe. There are people today who are a part of the stock of the house of Seth, and this is acceptable to God because they are Adamic and they are in his household. Even as when Joseph married Asnath, daughter of Potiphar, and the priest of On, there was nothing in violation of divine law between his marrying Asnath, daughter of Potiphar, the priest of On in Egypt, because this was a white waste priesthood that was established the days of Enoch and Job, and was still in Egypt when Joseph went down. Now was still in Egypt when Jesus was taken as a babe by Joseph and Mary down. Uh, to protect him from the ravages of jewelry. We point out to you that when the blessings of Jacob came upon the house of Joseph, it came upon his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now let my name Israel be named on these two lads. Why? Because this is a white race synthesis. And Enoch, in the days when God spake to him, said, Ye are my Israel, which means rulers with God, divine offspring, household of the Most High. I want you to know that while your Anglo-Saxon uh, forebears and your Scandinavian forebears were moving uh, across the heart of Europe and settling deep in uh, the fjords of Scandinavia and into the areas where Dan had preceded them and established his outpost, Danmark, Dan's land, and had named the Danube, the Knight, the, and Denise, and all these names that follow his migration and had been preceded by the Scythian settlements in the site of ancient Greece, which was a great Scythian or and house of Dan society. And as the Apostle Paul said, identified with Israel because all our fathers came out with Moses, all passed through the same waters and all partook of the same manner. I want you to realize that the house of Manasseh, which was one of the branches of the house of Joseph, had a very unique destiny. So not only had they been destined in the plan of God, which he knew from the beginning, that in their migrations the great number of settlers were Angles, and the first major dissenters, too, you know, early Protestantism, were among the Angles, and the Angles were those that desired most complete religious freedom, and made up a great part of those that migrated to this country. But you know, early before this, Manasseh was kind of restless. The ships of Dan were all over the Mediterranean. 
The ship Sedan came out between the pillars of Hercules and went on up the coast. The ship Sedan were also uh, trading with some of our Sethite forefathers in the Isles of Britain before all the parts of Anglo-Saxonism finally arrived. And so it was that on these ships of Dan, the men of Manasseh sought to go. They were not unlike their Viking cousins later to settle up in Europe. They wanted to probe and know and find the vastness of earth. They had a strange hunger to follow its outposts and to develop, and they had ideas that were to be carried out. You know, Dan had great courage. Long before the days when Christopher Columbus had uh, decided to uh, cross the ocean and reach India, why the peoples of your own race out of Scandinavia in the north had migrated all the way over to, the, to uh, North America on two occasions. And between the periods of 1800 B.C. and 760 B.C., Manasseh, a great company of them, and a large number of the Angles of your race, and before their passage is into final captivity, had embarked on the ships of Dan for a great exploration voyage. And they were born with the winds and with oar across the waters of the southern Atlantic. And they finally came into the Caribbean Sea. And they sailed into the Caribbean until they hit Central America. And here they landed, and as they landed, they were received at that landing by a people who had a civilization and a society already existing in Central America. These people were known to you as the Mayas. And the Mayas existed in this planet and were related in this continent and were related to the people to the north called the Tulipet. And they had a relationship to the later occupiers of a civilization that even existed high in the Andes, this is final uplift, known as the Inca. These were peoples who were a part of the pre-Adamic world. These peoples were connected with occupation race lines that had been in this earth before the great catastrophes that had swept it, had caused the sinking of great land masses in the Pacific and in the Atlantic. In their background, in their history, they talk about the volcanoes that smoked to the eastward, how great masses of land uh, were inundated beneath the water. They talked about how great crevices opened in the land, the water rushed in, and the steam blew the tops off the mountains, and the Maya story, and the writings, and the records of Horus of the Egyptians are synonymous concerning the thinking of the landmass that existed between uh, the continent we now call America and the Central Americas and Europe. The knowledge of this was known also later to Enoch when he settled, as you remember, uh, down in the land of Egypt, and having known all about this, because he was growing in the land where the descendants of Horus and these others had come, and having been taken in his experience high up to the presence of God, wrote in the records of Enoch things that were told unto him. Now when Plato, coming down out of our city and forefathers from the land of Greece, went down into Egypt for his education, he was educated by uh, the peoples in Greece, where, uh, or rather in Egypt, in the city of Oz. It was here that Plato learned about the civilization that came from Aratkan, and how it had been plunged beneath the waters in a mighty struggle between the gods of righteousness opposing the gods of darkness and their evil. And he tells the whole story, which we have no time to discuss tonight, the subject for another message. But I can tell you that uh, the story and the facts, and when Plato came home and wrote about Atlantis, and we named this ocean the Atlantic Ocean from Plato's enumeration of what had happened from what he was taught in Egypt. Now what the Mayas teach about what happened to the country to the east what is exactly like this. More than that, they tell about the great lands and the mighty dwelling places divided by great lakes of water and streams of water, and how the whole thing was plunged beneath the surface, the water swept over it, and the lands to the westward and into the setting sun. And what they talked about was what happened to the great continents of Lemuria, what happened to these great areas of, of civilization once existing out in the Pacific, where today we find Easter Island and a few of these spots but traces of the past. Yes, these Mayas had a a civilization which was very old. But in the instances of their dwelling, they had dwelt more or less at sea. Their cities had been built, their observation of the stars, their chronological records, their great cylinder discs of measure, which have become so much a part of the ancient civilizations of Latin America, which have derived their cylinder discs and their measuring stones from the Mayas. 
And the Mayans tell a story, and it's the most interesting one. They tell the story about how the white gods arrived. Who was it that arrived? They arrived in their time schedule and on their calendar, the exact time that a part of the tribe of Manassas, sailing on a ship to Dan, came across the great waters and arrived here. And you'll note the Bible even refers to how Manasseh crossed the waters. The word is not river, but across the, uh, Manasseh went across the waters. They didn't know what part of Manasseh, they knew part of it had gone, but they didn't know where it went. I want to point out something to you that's rather interesting. When these people arrived, there was an ancient tradition that just as it existed in the books of Horus and Egypt was in the records of the Maya. They believed someday that the great mighty God of the heavens would come down to protect that against the only thing they feared, the flying serpent, Quetzalcoatl, which also is similar to Quetzalcoatl of Mexico and of the Aztecs. The great flying dragon, the symbol of Lucifer, the same symbol as the dragon god and the flying serpent of Asia. But the god of light, whose many sons would come, would be greater than this. His many sons would come out over the earth, that they were going to be white men, and they were going to reflect the glory of the great and mighty god. They were referred to as the, son, the children of Osiris, the call of Ron, Egypt. They were called the children of the sun when they arrived. The so when Manasseh arrived in among the Maya. And when Manasseh arrived, they talked about the fact that they were the children of Yahweh, their father. And they told these natives of the Mayan civilizations about all the things that had happened in the background of their race. And that's why the Mayas have the story of inundation that took place at the Talian Basin. That's why they have the records of Noah. That's why they have the story of the serpent and of his power and how it entered into uh, the areas of the beginnings of your race. That's why they have the story which is so competitive to so many of the Bible stories. It isn't because that this was just a universal story told, it was because Manasseh had brought it to the Mayan people. More than that, they brought them uh, an understanding of measures and of the things of the Most High. And in the accordance of this, they became a teaching leadership in their society. Now I want to tell you that while this was going on, let's turn again to the northern part of America. Out of Scandinavia came Viking ships. They were the wing ships that moved across the Atlantic Ocean. Inside of them were the children of Asher and the children of Napoli and the children of Dan. For there was a great drive within them to plunge out into the unknown areas of the waters and discover what was on the other side. And so they, they landed these Viking craft with their great oars and their sails, with their sturdiness and with their ability to withstand privation, and they landed around the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. And when they arrived there, they started probing up the river, their great battle axes over their shoulders and those carrying with them necessary food and implements. They found it a rich land of wilderness, and they found it filled with game. But they found something else known unto that race in Scandinavia, your kinsmen. They found also around these great lakes, whose shores they also roam, the great and tremendous values of masses of iron ore. And they were metallurgists, and they understood and they knew how they might heat the ore and render the metal and beat and pound and produce of greater axes and fine blades. They saw also those that dwelt along uh, the banks of the streams and rivers who drew back into the trees and observed them. They were looking upon the people that by misnomer later would be called Indians. And so as they moved, they decided that it was too long a trip to try to go back in the year they had arrived. And so having arrived in a period that was some 600 years before the days of Columbus, and before the, the settlements that were to come thereafter, they then built for themselves stockades. These stockades they built as they hewed down the timbers, and they built them in the areas of Lake Michigan, and they also uh, built them around Lake Champlain in its northern part and on the edge of the St. Lawrence River. They decided that some of these natives appeared hostile. Every once in a while, why they were greeted with volleys of arrows, and they had few casualties. That's one of the reasons why they decided on making the strong bulwark defenses, for they were used also to some savages, Asiatic in type, that had even attacked them out of the fastnesses of Europe, where they had migrated out of their captivities to build the foundations of Scandinavian society. And so these 
sturdy people said we want to keep our votes. We don't want anything to happen to them. We're going to sail back next year. And so what did they do? They took their boats and they filled them with rocks and they sank them where they would be perfectly preserved underwater, where nothing would work on them or nothing would injure them. And then always when springtime came, Scandinavians would always bring their vessels up by many of their divers going down, lifting up the rocks and floating again their boats. By doing this, no natives of wherever they were would destroy their craft so they couldn't return. No one would know where their craft was or destroy their great Viking ships. This was their strategy from early times. And so having arrived in this new land and having uh, found that it was worth their development and they had decided to stay, they sank their Viking ships till spring when they were going to make their return trip. In fact, some of them were wiped out by the hostile natives of this country and never made their return. Just last year, a Viking ship was raised in the Great Lakes in perfect condition, where by the radiocarbon of that wood, we can prove that that, that ship came over about 500 years before the days of Columbus. Now, I happen to have a tremendous amount of record material research on this matter. Well, I am very much interested in the archaeology of my country and of my continent. I'm much interested in the fulfillment of God's plans and his sovereignty. This, this continent, then, had been planted by God in an ancient time in preparation for you. I'm going to point out one of the things God said about this. Uh, when in the beginning he spake his comfort unto Isaiah, and he told Isaiah concerning some of these things. He said, what are the things I'm going to do? He said, I have planted a wilderness. Now, Isaiah is already in Palestine. And he said, I planted this wilderness, this cedar tree. I planted this myrtle tree. I planted the cypress. I planted the box tree and the fir tree. I planted this large cedar of Lebanon. And I planted the land that is divided and overrunning with rivers and has water coming down out of its mountains, the greatest water crosses of the world. And I prepared this for you, my people, Israel. And the world can know that I've loved thee and I've planned this great place in the wilderness for you. So he said, well, he meant, I, he meant the land of Israel. Now let me show you something. The ancient cedars of Lebanon, those gutter guns of trees, were the mightiest redwoods that existed in the Palestinian world. The only place in the world where you can find redwoods are the redwoods that were the cedars of Lebanon. You know, they cut them all down, used them up and destroyed the seeds of Lebanon, but they were the greatest redwoods. They were used in the mighty temple of God. The only other place they grow is right here in the western half of the United States, in this great state of California, where we said, God, give us men to match our mountains, but take these schmooze and these bronze Indian homes. <laughs> in this great state that God preserved for some of the great works he was going to do. He had planted on one shore the great and the mighty cedars of Lebanon, the mightiest of the trees of the earth. He planted here the box tree, and across our forest to the box tree, the pine tree, and the cypress. More than that, he had planned this land for the greatest cutting of lumber the world was to know to find a land sustained with natural resources and blessed in this new area, and the only place outside of Palestine where myrtle wood grows. And here in our great, beautiful forest lands of northern California and of Oregon grows the myrtle wood tree. You say, why do you mention that? Because this is a place God was going to plant Israel, one of its greatest blessings, and this is where he sent you, your way. Let me take a look with you at what happens to the second wave of migration, for there were two of them. As again, great Viking ships joined as one Viking ship returned. And the records of Scandinavia tell us how a Viking ship returned to talk about this great land, its majestic forests, its mighty game herds, of its vital oars. For oar was a very vital thing to Scandinavians. It was with this they'd make their great blades. It was with this they would pour out their metal. It was with this they were going to prepare their great instruments. And among the leading metallurgists of the world are the Swedes and the Scandinavians. In fact, they came back again unto this land, this time a great companies of them, and they built along the Great Lakes their stockade cities, remnants of which can be found in archaeology every once in a while on earth to this day. But there was hostile natives, hostile natives that were Asiatic in their origin with mighty high cheekbones and who moved and 
and looked unusual to these Scandinavians who had not beheld this particular type of native before. They tried to treat them with friendliness, but they found uh, that the natives within these areas of this jungle and forest sought constantly their death by stealth. When they had bestowed upon them presents, they showed them for the first time their metal axes. They made gifts of metal axes to the natives of the country. And then they copied them to change even the type of their tomahawk, as the Iroquois did in North America, to the shape in comparison with the great iron axes of Scandinavia. And that's why the blunt tomahawk to the south changed to the more shapely tomahawk, like that of the axes of the Scandinavians. We are told about how they decided that they would lay, lay an attempt to wipe out these stockades. And so in the ancient tradition of the Mohicans and the Delawares comes the story of where they came from and what was their origin. Why was it that the Delaware and the Mohicans were white tribes and the white Iroquois were white and the white Cherokee and the white Seneca? Not like the Huron, skulking Asiatics that never kept their truces. These great cities of the Scandinavians built along the Great Lakes has started the refining of their ores that we can find today where they dug their ore out of the hills and where they uh, brought it into uh, molten condition and where they tore it out and molded in the clays their axes and their instruments. And only recently, archaeology uh, has uh, brought up, and the National Geographic and other magazines have shown the remnants of the, of the kilns that were built, from which the rendered material was poured into the molds of clay. And where these things are still found, and incomplete axes, and shafts, and steel, and bars, and scooters, and all these patterns of material are found. There has been found in the, in the areas around the Great Lakes of a great iron, uh, double-molded shaped figurehead. And the figurehead was like that of a great horse. And it had been so skillfully molded and prepared that it was made to place down over a great uh, pointed area of wood to become the figurehead of a Viking ship. And the two halves of it was found in the dirt and in the clays where the uh, clays had covered it and it had remained where the kiln had been prepared for the mold. Strange it might seem, these are but some of the records, but the record is that the Indians kept constantly attacking upon what we call uh, these Great Lake Colonies. And so realizing that they could not hold out, many of their ships destroyed, and they were depending on the following spring, probably returning to Scandinavia. Their leaders decided there was only one thing to do. Indians would not fight at night. They were superstitious. They fought in the daytime, but they wouldn't fight at night. For some centuries, they would not fight at night. And some tribes of Indians never will fight at night. They will cease that uh, at sundown and in the darkness and wait till the next day. So the Scandinavians said, with our women and with our children, with our weapons, we will go. We will leave these cities in the darkness. We will use our scouts to determine and by the campfires the location of these natives. And we also will go to the woods, and we also will stay a fluid society where we can't be cut off from the necessity of supplies. And we shall survive through this winter until a probably good year for our return. But it happened the people that produced these tribes of white, later called Indians, were actually Scandinavian blood that never had a chance to return. They fought a continual struggle in the wilderness of what we now call the northern United States and southern Canada. They made their way down southward into the mountains of the Blue Ridges and Pennsylvania and down into the Cumberlands, and they moved their way westward, and they joined into uh, other groups that uh, they now found, fighting their way into the Ozarks. And here we have a whole group of Indians known by the seven nations as the White Indians. This explains to you also the mystery of White King Philip. It explains unto you why the Narragansetts, a white tribe, a white Pocahontas, was blue of eye and so fair uh, that she looked as fair as any of the daughters in the Queen's court. And so we have white Indians. Why were they called Indians? Because we had a man that was a whole lot like a modern New Dealer. He didn't know where he was going when he went. This was Columbus. He didn't know where he was when he got there, down the Indies. And then he named the place India because he thought he was there. And he called all the people he saw Indians because he thought he was an Indian. 
And then he went back home and told what he saw on this coast of India, and he did every bit of it on borrowed money. So that's why they compare him with a lot of modern politicians. Don't know where they're going, don't know where they've been, and did it all on somebody else's money. Now, we're not trying to run down Columbus. So we are pointing out the man had great courage and he had great faith. He had a very scientific principle that the Bible supported ages before he was born. And after all, remember that he still belongs to branches of Israel's stock. Remember that Simeon and the peoples of, uh, are the peoples of Spain. And that Spain was a part of the prophecies which God made concerning your race. We might turn back for one moment into the book of Deuteronomy. Now we discover that among the things which are a part of destiny, God said when he divided the nations their inheritance, he separated the sons of Adam and he set the bonds of the nations of people according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Adamic house and the Israel people were God's portion, the Lord's portion is his people, and Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. God said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to cause these white race peoples that make up the great nations of the Western world. He said, I'm going to make this Israel a ride on high, the high places of the earth. Now he's going to eat of the increase of the fields. He's going to gather the honey out of the rock, and he's going to gather the oil out of the flinty rock. More than this, he's going to possess the great grazing lands, and he's going to have mighty wealth. Now I'm going to turn over to the, another portion of the book of Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter. And God said, and he's talking about all the various groups, he says, now for Joseph, this is the Anglo-Saxon peoples, the peoples that ended up the British Isles, and unto Joseph, blessed of Yahweh be his land, and for the precious things of heaven, and for the dew, and for the deep. For unto Joseph not only will move this, the precious fruits of the sun, and the precious things of the moon, which are the symbols of the Jew, for the chief things of the ancient mountains, its ores and its metals, for the precious things, its gold and its jewels of the lasting hills. For the precious things of earth and the fullness thereof. And also for the goodwill of those that even dwell in the bush. And the blessings shall come upon the head of Joseph and upon the head of him that was separated from his brother. And his glory shall be like the first things of the bullock and the horns of the unicorn. The symbol of Johnny Bull, the bullock and the unicorn of the British seal. And also with him shall they push together natives and peoples to the ends of the earth. And these shall be the ten thousands of Ephraim and the thousands of Manasseh. And when it talks about Simeon or Spain, it tells about he shall be a colonizer. While some consider him cruel, it's because he moves out into these areas. And the word for the striking, which means that he shall retaliate against those that don't take his peace, but turn to him their weapons. If you turn to the background of these prophecies, you'll know that these peoples that made up early Manasseh had gone down there between eight and 760 years before Christ to Maya, sailing on the ships of Dan. And they had proceeded by a whole millennium, the coming of the Scandinavians that went to North America. Now you say, what happened to these natives of the South? We have the story of the Narragansetts, we have the story of the Delawares and the Mohicans, and how their people had sailed across the oceans and had been met by hostile Red Indians, who they didn't call Indians, had their own name. Indians later called themselves Indians after the Anglo-Saxon takeover and the word India, and Indian was applied to all the peoples here. There's no greater misnomer in the world than to call the peoples uh, of the uh, dwellers originally in America Indians. There were two kinds of people dwelling in America, basically. They were Asiatics that had come down through the Bering Strait and had moved into Canada and to North America, and there were white men who had migrated out of the House of Israel from Manasseh and from Scandinavia, and there were a few people that had come out of the fall and the curse of the rebellion of Lucifer that had existed in the jungles of South America and had made their way up, some of them living in islands and some of them actually living in the southern tip of this continent, and these were Negroids, uh, and there was a very small number of them here. But the lower islands had some even before the white man came, and they had some in uh, South America before the white man came, because the Mayas talk about the dark and curly-headed ones just like the Sumerians did. Now we point out to you that when the Manassites were dwelling with the peoples of the Maya, 
and they were teaching them knowledge and wisdom and lore and the worship of the one true God, revitalizing their ancient religions, tied in with the pagan elements of yesterday, with new ideas, and they received these white men as the children of the Most High, the children of the Son. But Asiatic Indians were coming with increasing migrations. They had come down along the coast of Western America. They moved down into Central America, and wherever they went, they waged war even against the other local tribes that were here. But they approached the great cities of the Mayas in Central America, and here they discovered the impregnable fortresses with which these people went in and just stayed on the inside and fight, they just went inside. They had their own water supplies and their great springs. They had their great storehouses filled with grains and with nuts, and they could last for a long season. But there was one thing that the Asiatic Indian knew. He had passed deposits as he traveled across this country of the substance known as sulfur. The Asiatic Indians had for some time known that when sulfur was lit on fire that it strangled men, gave them wheezing such as modern asthma from the fumes of sulfur. And so the Asiatic Indians went and gathered uh, great amounts of sulfur, drew it on crevices behind their, their animals, and they brought them uh, south. Now, it is true that these natives uh, carried great amounts of sulfur around the Mayan cities. And then they waited until the wind was blowing towards the cities and they lit them on fire. And the fumes of the sulfur blowing into the Mayan cities started to strangle the people inside. They had exits and tunnels that carried them out into the jungle. Your Manasseh white forefathers that had dwelt in this part said it's time to go. And they guided some of the Maya out and they went into the jungles and they started wide the fighting war parties who didn't know there was under passages from these cities that led out into the jungle. They carried their trek to the northward. They fought now where fighting was necessary, but they had not been prepared for this. They had even prepared for themselves weapons uh, in order to combat these natives from the outside after the assault. The Mayas had never heard of these people from the north. They were surprised. They had fought against the Incas in ancient times when some of the Incas had waged war against them because of the uh, divisions of their theology and their dispersions of the gold uh, that came from the rich mines of South America. Now these people traveled northward to the land now known as the Tulipec land. And where the cities of the Tulipecs were built are rocker buildings in which the Mayas are fused with the Tulipecs, and the whites that are referred to by the Tulipecs as the sons of the sun and children of the sun, which white men were your own Manasseh forebearers that had come across by that route. So almost all of you have been forebearers in Manasseh and in Joseph and in Germany by route of the immigrations of later colonization. What happened when they moved northward? They managed to move into areas of South America where they built the seven cities of gold. Or rather in southern United States, where in northern, north of Mexico, in what is now known as New Mexico. These seven cities of gold were cities overladen with the temples to the eternal God and their various buildings overlaid with gold. The words of this were known among the natives as the cities built by the sons of the gods of the sun. And so we discover this, that Indian tribes or tribes of Asiatics started to war against the white tribes, and they warred back and forth. And during these wars, their tribes became also battling tribes of fierceness. And so we had white battling tribes still revering the great white spirit. You'll note that all of the white Indians worship the great white father and the great white spirit. Why was it that Indians worship the white spirit? Only Indians that worship the white spirit instead of devils and devil gods had emerged out of the white race. And they knew the symbol of white and white supremacy. This is the reason why the white Indians, among them were the white Cherokee, among them were the white Sioux, as well as Asiatic tribes joined later called Sioux. Among them were whole groups of, of white Indians, and among the later nine nations, three of these strongest ones were white nations. When the sun hit them, it bronzed their skin. They were more bronzed than they were red. When they uh, threw off their coverings and their blankets and their trappings, their skin was light, even like that of all their white kinsmen. And only where they were exposed to the sun 
uh, where they lived in the constant outdoors was their face tan or bronze. And thus one could soon tell a white Indian from the others when if he came into civilization or if he was covered by any clothing or why he remained white under the clothing and was only bronze to the surface. This is why so many Cherokee are white. This is why so many of the Seneca were white. So many of the Sioux. So many of these many tribes which we could name and could name them all if we were just speaking on Indian tribes. Now it is that they were located here in this continent fighting for survival. In the days when Columbus sailed across and brought back his report and his record, there was a long before Spain decided that they must explore more fully this country. And that's one of the reasons why we discover uh, the coming to this country of Cortez and the, the uh, coming of the conquistadors. So I said this was a terrible approach. No, they came and they brought with them their clergy. They brought with them the standards of their gods and the standards of Christ. They first came with friendliness in their approach, but they were treated with not only hostility but treachery. And then came the coolness of Simeon. Simeon never forgave the treachery of the nation. He fought with a fury. And when you stop and consider how a little over 1,600 men arrived on ships from Spain and fought their way all the way around the southern branch of what we know as the United States, and in one case they went through the Caribbean in an island hopping expedition, how they moved through all the areas of Panama and Butter Wilderness, while they met untold numbers of these savages of the jungle and made their way all the way to the top of the Andes Mountains, marched back carrying the root of the world, and were able to get back to Panama and many of them to get back to the coast and some of them to get all the way back to Spain to tell what they saw. I have in my library some of the finest of the old records written uh, by uh, Spanish uh, fathers and friars who traveled with them who kept an accurate daily account and I have several of the volumes of the finest work on the conquistadores and how they went across the country and you know when they ran into the Aztecs of South America uh, the first thing that the Aztecs said children of the sun to return to the gods. And when they reached the edge of what was remaining of the two of pets, again they were said, children of the sun, remnants of the Maya, greeted the columns of Cortez as the children of the gods. And they talked about how ancient times their forerunners had come across, and they got them, they told the story of how these had told them about their gods, and the, the friars that came with them were to tell the story in their records of how these people knew about Noah, and they knew about the promises of the coming of a Messiah, and how they understood about the giving of the commandments and of the law, and how a mighty God of the sun came down with his host and gave it upon a high mountain in a distant land. We're not going to justify nor are we going to criticize the fact that Simeon did push wherever he went. And he went and he came back and he sold a Spanish hole that was to touch the southern half of the United States later and was to continue its implanting for all this had been done in the name of the King of Spain until this very great state of ours we rested out of our, of our Spanish brothers when we decided to belong uh, more completely to this country. A large part of this land had its de deeds on this Spanish land. Now, John Cabot, to be followed by British explorers and colonizers, developed the country, and we had rather family feuds between the French and the English and the Spanish over who was going to determine the destiny of these United States. But this had been prepared for the leadership of the master of the House of Joseph. If you don't believe that, then you tell me why you're talking English tonight. <laughs> it was the outstretched wings of the American Eagle that was to take its great place. Today there is no battling hostility between any of these who are our brother race over the fact that this country has grown strong and powerful. In fact, we have become their best asset as time has proved. Now let us remember then that in the days of the colonies, hostile Indians continued to fight the approach of the coming of the French and the British. And in these battles that normally it was the Delaware and the Mohican that stood with the English. And the Narragansett, ship, except when uh, there was involvement and the French had used the Hurons, they had betrayed with treachery. But the struggle came on. The other day when Paul Coates thought he was going to outfox Connie Lynch on the television the other night, he said, you talk about the fact of this being our country and that we're not going to let uh, it be taken over by the Negroes and these other people. He says, don't you remember how your people, talking to Connie Lynch, came and took this away from you? Well, that's all right, because the Indians hadn't done anything with it. Look what we've done with it. 
They were here for a millennium, and we've only been here a few hundred years. And since we've done this, we're not about to give it up. Now, I want you to know this tonight. So we said, aren't you uh, disturbed about where we treated the Indians? No. No. I remember how the Indians came down and tried to burn out the white cities and starve them and to cause them to choke to death under the sulfur. How they met friendliness with hostility with Asia, with the cruelty and the cunning that would mark a reinvasion from Red China if it came today. I'm aware also that in this course of destiny we developed a continent that was ours and prepared for us under God. He didn't design this continent to be occupied by our enemies. He designed this continent to be occupied by his children. In the course of our destiny, we, as prophecy said, the day would come for the house of Joseph and for the peoples of Israel and for the mother lioness and the British lions, where they would say, this place is too narrow for us to dwell, and some of us are going to go over there and dwell in a far land. And as God had promised David when he came to buy his sword with green crown, that he, I have a new place for you in the wilderness, far beyond the waters, which I'm going to plant your people, and some of your people shall dwell there, and they shall never move again. Well, that not only was partially true to the British Isles, but even more, it was true of this great land across the great waters of the ocean. And as we talked to you about how God told about how the foes of the plantations of the seed of David planted in Ireland by the great waters was going to spread until that empire stretched out over all parts of the earth. But you, this great nation, from your colonial origins to your day of destiny, when inspired forefathers of your nation, led by such men as George Washington, John Adams, and Benjamin Franklin, and others, Signed their names to a declaration of independence to establish the house of the outstretched wings of the in its political destiny. Now, I want to point out to you that it wasn't long thereafter when the conventions of these United States formed first their provision of their Articles of Confederation and later their Constitutional Convention. And they adopted the great seals of the United States at its birth side. And when they adopted the seal of the United States, I want to call to your attention, for you find it on a dollar bill. Now, every once in a while, somebody that doesn't know anything about this says the reason we got this on our dollar bill is because Henry Wallace got some wild ideas, and he thought this had to be put on the dollar bill, and it was Masonic, and therefore it was a Jewish trick. Now, I want to tell you something. The Jews never created or had anything to do with the creation of masonry. They have invaded masonry to destroy it, and the masons will never retain their greatness till they blackball every Jew out of the Masonic Lodge. <laughs> so what they have done to Jewry, they have also done to the church. Now, this emblem didn't start with Henry Wallace. These, this is the seal of the United States. This was adopted by the United States government. People didn't see it very often. And if Henry Wallace was responsible for seeing it was put on the dollar bill, then that's one thing we owe that fuzzy brain some thanks for. <laughs> we look at the pyramid, the ideal symbol of messianic building. The first recreated temple built in the days when Enoch erected that mighty pillar in Egypt. It has no capstone upon it because it's the symbol of God's new kingdom. This great nation of yours was to be built under this destiny. The destiny which is also reiterated by the Apostle Paul for a great Christian society. All of you as living stones fitly framed together, growing into a holy temple under God, in which he is the chief capstone. And in it is the all-seeing eye of God looking over over the destiny of this people. And so, above the pyramid on your seal and on the back of your dollar bill is annual correctness. He prospers our gathering and our taking out of the nation. Now we go below this and we know that it says, No, this order secular, new order of the ages, new Jerusalem. The promises that were in the writings of the apostles concerning the great new order and the new Jerusalem that was to be built in the earth. Let me point out to you, that this emblem with the Shekinah glory around the eye, the prophecy of your beginnings, the new order of the ages. Now we turn to the other side of the sea, of the, of the sea. We see the outstretched wings of the eagle. It was to this woman, which is Israel in the white race, that brought forth the man-child Christ, that in the hour of tribulation, when the hordes of the dragon and the dragon hordes tried to destroy God's kingdom, as the seed of Lucifer, the fallen rebellious angel called the dragon, described to you in the 12th chapter of Revelations with detail. 
defeated in space with his war against Michael, had tried to overthrow and conquer the earth, had upset its civilizations and societies, and that God put your race on it. And from the days of Adam until the time of the founding of this great nation, God has been progressively developing the strategies of his plan to retake the earth, and you're the great part and theme of it. Now listen. We point out to you that it talks about how to this civilization of the white race is given the two wings of a great eagle, that she might not only fly to the wilderness where she'd be nourished over her time, times, and half time, but the serpent and the dragon, which is the Luciferian hordes, would cast out their seed, their race, their unassimilatable peoples, and gather the hordes of earth to try to swallow your race up in their great swan. And it says even the natural forces of nature are going to help you as God uses them to defend you, and before it's over, when the struggles with your head, the earth is going to swallow up these masses of the pagans that seek to overthrow you. So the dragon is angry in these last days with your race and is trying to make war with all that remain of his seed because they have the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now you take a look around this great nation. It's a Christian nation. It has the commandments of God, the testimony of Jesus Christ. The only problem we have is the unassimilatable 45 million that we can do without. Back to the seal of this great nation under God. The outstretched wings of an eagle. And above it, in a great Shekinah glory, a cluster of 13 stars, making the six-pointed star of the kingdom of God, which is the pyramid building upward and the pyramid downward, the divine symbol of the mighty strength of the kingdom. The Jews don't own that star, and the star they made is interlapping, not overlaid, and it's made out of a serpent. Now I look at this. This was destiny. Thirteen colonies. And remember that the house of Joseph, the twelfth tribe, produced thirteen tribes. Ephraim and Manasseh. Manasseh, the thirteenth tribe, is also the founder of a nation of thirteen colonies whose national heraldry is thirteen. If you look in the cluster of the eagle, you see the pale rays of God's standard and shield upon the breast of the eagle. You read these words. As you look above it, he pulled the shoot them, the one out of the many. And we are one out of the many tribes that carry the great heraldry of the master. So what is the gathering of Israel to be? Now listen. You look down into the talons of the eagle. You see in one hand the arrows. The scripture says that he was going to bless the arrows of Joseph. For though Joseph was, uh, had a great prophecy, and we may read it here in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, he talks about uh, these things that relate to Joseph. And he talks about how the blessings would come upon the head of Joseph. And we know here that uh, in the 38th chapter of the uh, book of Genesis, we get, uh, in the 49th chapter, we get blessings concerning the very sons of Jacob. It says Joseph is a fruitful bough on this great kingdom tree. His branches are going to run over the wall. The archers of the enemy are going to be sorely grieved at him, and they're going to shoot at him. But the bow of Joseph shall abide in strength. The arms of his hands will be made strong by the hands of the house of Jacob, and from thence is the shepherd and the stone of Israel, the leadership of the kingdom. Now, America moves under Joseph Haraldry just as Britain does, because we carry the Haraldry of the Eagle, and we carry in the Eagle the arrows of Joseph. On the other side, we carry the symbol of Israel, for Israel is an olive tree. And the peace of God is the peace of a new order, a new Jerusalem, old city, Salem peace. So America stands as the great defender of the kingdom. It offers the peace branch of God's kingdom for the recognition of its children. It offers the arrows if this is what they desire, for the bow of Joseph will abide his strength. His arms will be made strong by the mighty God of Jacob. Now I turn to point out to you something that's over in the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, God says concerning you when you come out of your captivities and been brought to your dwelling places where God is going to put you in these lands. And he said, out of this people who have come out of their captivity will emerge the voice of thanksgiving and the voice of those that are merry and I will multiply them and they're not going to be a few and I'm going to glorify them and they shall not be small. And the children shall be as a poor time. And their congregation shall be established before me, and I will punish all that oppress them. And so far, you've never lost a struggle. 
Now listen. It tells you that the nobles of this new land, this is the part of the people that the found the place to Nato and moved across this land of the wilderness, this land where God had already planted it for you with the finest of the trees and the best of the earth, had already prepared for you what he said he was going to do because you were going to get the oil out of the flinty rock, the mighty values of crude oil and of petroleum. You were going to have all of these things and you have them. Now listen. He says, their nobles shall be of themselves, and their governors shall proceed out of the midst of them. And I will cause him to draw near and approach unto me. And he's going to make this proclamation. What proclamation? He's going to proclaim thanksgiving. You know you're the first country to officially proclaim thanksgiving and make a holiday out of it and it's spread to every white nation of the world? Did you know, as you well understand, that your nobles are your own elected representatives and they come from among the people? And your governors are from among the people, and you have lifted them up. And it doesn't make any difference, even the rascals we've had. They, every one of them has to give lip service to our Father, and they have to make the proclamations, and they have to set aside the days of the people that pulled them off their purse. God, wait, God says unto you, ye are my people, and I will be your God. Every hear people say this is God's land? I can prove it to you. The first place God said more than this, behold, when the whirling things come. When the flying saucers come in, when the whirlwinds come, and God goes forth in his fury, and with his continuing whirlwinds of circling objects, and he shall bring judgment to fall upon the heads of those that would harm his people. Some people don't know where some of our reinforcements are going to come, and there's some people in town that are worried about it. I want you to move into the 18th chapter of Isaiah as we close this phase of this message with speed because of the time. And we'll take this message up again for further conclusion. Woe unto the land. Now the word is the 18th chapter of Isaiah, and the word woe and ho or salutations is one and the same in its original translation. It's not woe, it's ho. More than this, other translations are clearer than this one, but you can't even cover here. Ho to the great land of the outstretched wings. The days of Isaiah, you haven't even become a nation. 1776 was a long ways away. Ho to the land of the outstretched wings of the river, westward beyond the waters at the edge of Ethiopia, North Africa. It sends its ambassadors by sea in water-drinking vessels. In your Bible, it says vessels of bulrushes. Look it up. It says water-drinking vessels, but they didn't know what it meant. But of course, we know what it means because it means steamships, water drinking vessels, it sends its ambassadors by sea. The United States of America is the land of the outstretched wings of the eagle. We are the land that has to send our ambassadors by sea unless they go to Canada or to South America. They go by sea. We are the land that is one of the greatest and is one of the greatest in its merchant marine. It sends its ambassadors by sea. It says, and says, Go ye swift messengers of our people, tall and clean shaven. And your Bible says scattered in fields. You go back and check the lectures again. Go back and see the translation of a nation of people tall and clean shaven. You know, generally speaking, you're one of the tallest nations on the face of the earth. And you know that you're the most clean shaven people on the face of the earth until this Castro Street came along. You pretty well can watch that. Your soldiers have been clean shaven. And you are one of the great, one of the great marks of the fact. Now, note this. A nation which is powerful from their beginning, and this time with it too. Did you ever stop and think that you were the young lion that spanked the mother in the, out of the book of the future? And from the time that you were a nation, you have been a powerful and a terror to evil. Why, you took a handful of boats not much bigger than shrimp boats and sailed across the ocean and whipped the pirates of Sicily with it. You promised from the very beginning that you were not going to take anything from any of the forces that even sought to act as tyrants over this little nation. You raised up a standard of courage and of bravery with the God so we could once more rekindle an awareness of this in American people when we cleanse this land in 30 days. It says this new land would be a nation meted out and trodden down or measured out into foot. You are one of the first nations in the world to pass a surveying law called the Meets and Bounds Act. 
and all property is surveyed by township, north, south, east, and west, and laid out in this nation. And all over Europe, you buy it from this rock to that tree to somebody's barn, and they survey it according to landmarks, and whether they eventually make it north, south, east, and west in relationship to places they set out. The sex line principle has not been adopted in many parts of the world, but you were the first nation to be thoroughly surveyed and thoroughly measured out by sections and townships and meets and bond acts. And God had this back in Isaiah before you were born. The land through the rivers have divided. It says spoiled. It means divided. So there's some on the engineers trying to dam it all up to keep the water from running away and says the rivers are spoiling it, but I think it's the new deal and the new frontier that's spoiled. There's nothing more valuable to a people than water, lots of water, good water. And Californians better be praying God send us a lot of water. Anyhow, water is your heritage. And you know that you have the greatest rivers in the world and some of the finest rivers in the world in your continent. No nation has been more bountifully blessed by great rivers and by the areas of natural waterfall. We live in California in the desert areas because we choose to live there. I uh, don't uh, have the uh, fluency of water, but we've come out of parts of the country where we have it, and we can thank God it's still there, and we might go hungry sometimes. Now, we have a land divided by rivers. If you ever take the map of the United States, you'll know that over four-fifths of all the boundaries between states are rivers. Like the Hudson River dividing New York and New Jersey, and, and the Mississippi River, and the Missouri River, and the Columbia River, and uh, the, uh, all of these rivers, you'll discover that the boundaries in the Colorado River between California and Arizona, so almost all the boundaries of our state are rivers, the nation divided by rivers. Now listen. Now all you inhabitants of the world and dwellers on earth, See ye when he lifts up the end sign on the mountain, and when he blows the trumpet, hear ye. When this nation lifts up the standard, that's going to be the standard of Christianity and of the symbol of God's cross. And to this, Christian nations shall rally in their defense against the dragon, the Antichrist, the communist, the world jury, and everything else. Now, we will find our leaders and our people being a part of this, even in their ignorance. We find them also calling the rally to the nations around it. Today, the enemy's got a trick. He's trying to call us to the standards of the Antichrist called the United Nations to swallow up our Christian society. We better wake up and lift up our standards again on the mountain because we're going to do this. We're going to lift up that standard if it's strange faces that blow the trumpet. Listen. For all the inhabitants of the world know this America is God's country, for God said it. When I take my rest, now, when I consider my dwelling place, what is it? It's in this new nation, the outskirts of the It's God's country. I can believe that when I look at the beauty of the redwoods, when I see the majesty of the towering rockies, I can understand why God loved this place. He poured out the best of his beauty on this continent. And people that don't love it better leave it and leave it fast. This is. He says, I'll take my rest, and I'll consider this my dwelling place, and I will be like clear heat growing the herbs with blessing, and I will be like the cloud of dew that waters the land at the harvest time. I will be a blessing to this people, and I will bless them, and I'll multiply. You know how blessed you are? Why, you can't eat the wheat you can grow. The people all over the world wonder whether they're going to get enough to eat, and you don't know what to do with all you can grow. God's bless everything you've ever put your hands to. You've got every natural resource, every blessing. Anytime you have a depression in the United States, it's because these schmoozes have conned you out of the control of your own goods and have confiscated your money by which you move it. Next time they try to threaten you with depression, take it out of the gym tie. Mr. Kennedy told us last week that if we didn't follow and accept his tax plan, we're going to have a terrible depression. Well, there's a good thing to reduce taxes and then stay within the budget and cut off foreign aid to all the peggings in the world. Now let's take another look at this. And it says, now, therefore, in the end, just before the harvest, there's going to be a pruning. Before the harvest, there's going to be a pruning of the strings, the branches, and the hooks that I'm going to take away and cut down the outside branches. And so in these latter days, there's no pruning going on. You let go of the Philippines, you let go of Cuba, you let go of your outside territory, and the only things that you retain are those that you qualify as safe. But you're just clearing the decks with some action that's ahead. So therefore, 
These areas outside that you let go have been left under the bowels of the mountains and the beasts of the earth. These territories that you had, like the Philippine Islands and Cuba, the beasts have already moved in on Cuba, and they're already planning from Sicarno and Asia to seize the Philippines, and every place where the branches are proved, it says the beasts of the earth move in for this last struggle. If this involves you, that God said in this great day when the beasts of the earth even tried to devour the branches that were pruned off, God Almighty says in that time, shall this great nation bring its mighty, mighty blessing and service to the most high God, this people tall and clean shaven, powerful from their beginning. God said they bring a mighty gift, the outstretched wings of this powerful eagle, it says, shall be the great striking power. Let me tell you when the eagle screams, the serpent smooth, the snake run to the breast. The symbol of the eagle flying high and dropping the lizard, the dragon, and the snake to the ground makes this a good symbol for you. Some people want to change this. Somebody wanted to make a turkey out of it. Well, you eat turkey. <laughs> I never saw a turkey smart enough to kill a snake. I'm going to tell you, if we'll have many more years like the kind of presidents we have, we'll act like turkeys instead of eagles. <laughs> but God Almighty has a great declaration for you. He said, the Lord's portion is his people, and like an eagle stirring up her nest and fluttering over her young, spread the wings and take them on high, so God has led you, no strange God, and he's taught you to fly his great nation, fled the eagles. As the eagle god identifies your symbol of the eagle as the flying house of his living sense. Uh, the doctrine is the greatness of your destiny. We haven't the time to finish this subject tonight. We're going to talk on the further destiny of the United States next week as we talk about from this period of time on the future before the United States of America. We're going to talk about the part. The Bible has much to say about the development of this part. So we're going ahead with this subject. We'll finish this subject in uh, another message on this topic. We we'll tell you tonight, the book is filled with graces. We want you to know that your nation is of divine origin. God skillfully guided your race on time after time towards the continent. And the seed that has been planted here has never been absorbed. Some people say, well, there's white blood mixed with Indian blood. Most of the cases, the white blood is mixed with white blood. Most of the time, the affinity of early plantings were made. But I'm going to tell you this. The majority of people in the United States, 145 million of them are white Christians. And they today are a great and mighty household God has raised up. And we have become again one great, strong, mighty country out of these many tribes of Israel. We can't absorb anything that's non Israelites. We can't absorb Jews that are Canaanites, Hittites, or Amalekites. We can't absorb Negroes that belong back in the jungle and not here. We cannot absorb anything uh, that is not of our household. If it dwells in our land, it must dwell in peace and by our laws. And we cannot long support or sustain leaders that will not fulfill our destiny, maintain our sovereignty and our independence, and keep these strangers from flooding over us. Thank